dung 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 under pressure it's how you feel sometimes when you're writing all of those grants it's true grants can be stressful fixed deadlines unanswered emails crazy application portals mm -hmm. how about unrealistic expectations from people who have no idea how the process works and that's just the tip of the iceberg ask us how we know not addressing these stressors can lead to serious burnout but the D.H. Leonard Consulting Team doesn't believe that needs to be the case. They can help you through the entire grant life cycle, from grant readiness to grant management. If there's a part of grant seeking that is stressing you out, reach out to dhleonardconsulting.com to let them help take the stress out of grants. Dum, 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 dum. Well, hello there. I'm Kimberly Hayes Day Muga. And I'm Amanda Day. And you're listening to the Fundraising Heyday Podcast. So we're here to help you make sense of the complex world of grant writing and fundraising, including how to raise money, how to win grants, but also, and I think even more importantly, how to work together to change philanthropy for the better. That's right. And we're doing this every two weeks with the help of cheesy sound effects and songs because learning doesn't have to be boring. Although my backdrop is very boring today, if you're watching on YouTube, it's the wrinkly green screen. Hi, um, this is how the magic is made. This podcast is brought to you by our season six sponsor, D.H. Leonard Consulting and Grant Writing Services. Their team can help make grants less stressful by assisting you with grant readiness and training, grant research, grant writing, mock review, as well as providing numerous DIY resources, guides, and templates. Don't let grants stress you out. Did you know that with every Fundraising Heyday episode, we create a coordinating blog post on their website, dhleonardconsulting.com. Check it out today. Well, hello, dear listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the Fundraising Heyday podcast. If you can believe it, we are past the halfway mark of 2023 and season six of our beloved pod. <laughs> yeah, I will say this year, the season has been flying by. I've enjoyed so many incredible guests and the educational value we're bringing to our listening audience. And I'm also excited for the lineup through the rest of the year. So in fact, today's topic is something that I think is super helpful, especially for those who are ready to dip their toe in the fun filled world of federal funding. <laughs> I'm simulating dipping a toe, dipping a toe. <laughs> visual, cheesy visual and cheesy sound effects. I, we're just really at the top of our game. Um, so federal funding, my situation has kind of reversed for the first half of my career or the first big part of my career it was mainly focused on private funding. So mm -hmm. corporate and foundation grant applications, which also require study and um, strategic thinking around what to go for and why and finding the best match. But federal funding and some state proposals too, Yep. The the, the um, request for proposals or the notice of funding opportunity or funding opportunity announcement. So a cornucopia of acronyms, RFP, NOFA, um, NOFO, FOA, EIEIO, are usually super detailed. Most of the time, pretty clear, but you're yep. guaranteed pages and pages of, of close, uh, closely spaced information. Um, so that's why we want to spend time today talking about how to read one of these. I don't mean at the actual how to read, of course, but how to deep read and understand so that you become the subject matter expert to guide your team, your clients through the process. It's important yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah, because you're reading it with that eye of... Like what's important? What do we immediately need to focus on? Right. So I'm always reading it. Even if we think we're going for it, I'm always reading it from a lens of, are we really going for this? Is there something in here that makes me think, whoop, nope, this is not for us. See, this is again, Amanda's the nice one. I read, I read RFPs, NOFAs and OFAs because I want to find out why the client or the, the agency would not be a good fit. 
simply because federal grants can be a lot of work and resource hungry things. Yep. And so Absolutely. I want to make sure that the agency is a, is, is a competitive fit. So I'm reading it with how is this not a good fit versus why is this the perfect fit? But same idea, just, yeah. you know, same Whatever two lens. So, oh. But let's assume you have found what you think is that perfect grant application. It's got an upcoming deadline and you're thinking, yeah, we want to move forward with this proposal. So we're going to share some insights and tips and tricks on how to thoughtfully read those guidelines to help you best prepare your proposal that you're going to put together. So um, I wanted to start off with a few general proposals, uh, or general pointers rather. Yep, yep. Um, whether this is 25 pages or 150 pages, you really do need to read every word in that document. Yes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, for those of you who can't see, I was making ooh, ooh sounds and raising my hand because I got something to say. <laughs> I would say I read each one more than once. Yes. And I actually, and I'm sorry to the trees because I really do try and save paper. I'll just print double-sided a lot of times and print it out and read it in addition to storing it because I'm like highlighting things and making notes. So don't well, think. Got, yeah. And don't I'm, think that it's just one and done. Can, yeah. I know you can't see us, but for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, yeah, here sitting on my desk is one I'm currently working on. And I don't know how well you can see, but like. Um, it says National Community Care Corps and you can see how. Yes how lovingly you have highlighted yeah, it. Yeah, highlighted, and I take notes because those are like, it's easy. And this one's not that long, actually. It is only 19 pages. So for this is a federal grant true. that was passed to a, um, actually to a non-federal entity, and then they're doing sub-awards. Um, so 19 pages is not too bad. But even then, it's, I like my highlights because then I can, easily skim to find the most important things that I'm looking for and with notes and everything. So yeah, so read it, mark it up, figure out what works best for you. So, so, but anyway, but again, you're reading every word, even though it's boring. I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, federal RFPs, not thrilling reads. Kimberly and I love to read. These are not fun. I don't read these for my enjoyment, but you got to. Um, and the first lens I'm looking at through when I read it really is, are we even eligible? Because, you know, sometimes you think you are, but then you start reading the fine print and you're like, yeah, they say they give to nonprofits. But when you look at all the requirements or when you look at some of the things that they ask about, you're like, yeah, we don't really, a school would do that, but we don't as a nonprofit. So eh, maybe that's not us. Um, I also want to know how many awards they're making, right? Sometimes federal grants, they make one award. One. And, and so it's if probably that's not going to be to you. I'm probably, sorry. Yeah, but you're right. It's probably not unless you read it and you're like, yep, we do that. This we do us. it exceptionally well. We do this exceptionally well. We excel at this. So yeah, knowing how many they're going to award helps you decide. And because sometimes it's only, say it's 50. Well, that's probably one per state. Are you the best in your state at doing this? You know, and of course, and that doesn't include territories. I'm just no, saying. that's true. Yeah. And you'd like to think you are, but eh. so that's something. And then I also make sure I'm paying attention to all the deadlines. And I say all the deadlines because obviously there's going to be a hey, this needs to be submitted by this date. But more and more often, I'm seeing on federal proposals these days that there'll be one deadline for grants.gov, but there's another deadline for whatever that funder's portal is, whether it's just grants for Department of Justice or what is it, ERA Commons for yep. uh, Department of Education. NEA so, has their own portal as well. Yeah. So there could be multiple deadlines. Sometimes there's a required webinar. Sometimes there's a required survey some, so that you have to meet by a certain date. So sometimes if you want to ask questions, you have to submit questions by a deadline. And after that, they won't answer any questions. So just make sure you pay attention to all the deadlines. Um, Can I hop in with something else real quick? I'm absolutely. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm, like being, I'm being answer hog today, but oh, go. Oh. It just the the point that I wanted to make is to add on when you were talking about eligibility, and we've yeah. talked about this in multiple podcasts, and we I will continue to talk about this, and Amanda will too, I'm sure. It's eligibility is one thing, but then how competitive you are. And I just yeah. wanted to bring that up because you're talking about, you know, how many grants are going to be awarded? What is the deadline? What is this? Are we in the scope? Are we eligible to apply because we're a nonprofit or a municipality? But the scope of what the grant is actually looking for is above and beyond that. So mm -hmm. as the grant 
professional. You can be the thought leader, subject matter expert on that and help your agency or your clients determine that eligibility, which gets back to what I was saying. I'm reading this going, yep, yeah, I'm thinking you got to convince me that this is a good fit. And generally it's, <clears throat> I find that a lot of people get stuck on that eligibility. Well, we, we are eligible and it's like, that doesn't mean that you're competitive. So I just wanted to hold that up again yeah. and mm -hmm. carry on my friend. Yeah. Well, in that same vein, that's something I'm, when I'm reading, I'm always looking for something. Is there something in there, even though we're eligible, that makes us not competitive? Like maybe they give priority points to someone who does X, Y, Z. Well, if it's like, well, we don't do that, but we're still eligible. Yeah. But if they're only giving out even a hundred awards, that's still not a lot when you're talking about across the entire country. Right. So things to think about. Um, another thing too is, um, are there different categories? Sometimes right. like the one I'm working on now, <clears throat> Um, you have to decide whether you're providing services to this type of population or this type of population. So you'll fall within one of those categories, which could change, you know, some of the questions that they may ask. And so if there's multiple categories, just make sure that you do fit in one and put yourself in the right category. Like I've seen them based on size. Like I've seen a Department of Justice grant that based on the number of police officers you have determines which category you're eligible to apply for, which may affect how much money you're allowed to ask for, right? So just making sure you're paying attention to all of these. This is kind of some big overarching things as you're jumping into it. And if you are, even if you were voluntold that you will now be the grant writer in addition to other duties as assigned, or if that is your other duty as assigned, know that if you can get in and learn this and get inside this instruction manual for a guide, you could either a really well pos position your agency for success with the grant or go, Hey, we are not really competitive for this based on these five things and be able to point them out and demonstrate cut and paste and pull that out. It's yeah. my turn to jump in. Um, Come in. And if you're having issues with, you know, sometimes <laughs> you've got bosses who don't, it's like they're thinking you just don't want to write the grant. Mm hmm. You, your friends here, Kimberly and Amanda, have a fabulously handy go, no go decision making guide. So if you want to mosey on over to the homepage of our website, heydayservices.com. H-A-Y-D-A-Y. Yep. Um, you, it's a free download. It's a two page document and it just helps you kind of, it just asks a bunch of questions and you kind of just check yes or no. And then based on that, that can help guide you towards should we do it or should we not? And if someone's like, well, I don't understand why we're not you could show them that document and kind of walk them through like, Hey, look, look at how many no's we we've got on this. That's, it's just not going to happen or it's just yeah. not going to make us competitive. So that could be a handy tool. Just food for thought. It's free. Might as well grab it. I think it's cool too. Of course I am deeply biased and there are plenty of examples of grant decision making yes. tools out there, but you know, ours is cute. You should go get it. Um, <laughs> So another thing to think about as you are doing your deep read is to even back up further than eligibility versus competitiveness and deadlines. Very important, all of these. But if you're deciding, if you're, if you're like not quite, you know, if you're on the fence, make sure that you and those around you, wherever you're working, understand where your agency or organization has to be registered. I will just give you a quick example. Um, so it's you back in the day, doodly doodly doodly, um, we used to have to have DUNS numbers, right? Well, now you need a unique entity identifier or a UEI, mm -hmm. um, which I'm trying not to make a really inappropriate joke about how it reminds me of, you know, disorders. So I'm just not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that is a process. It's great that the government is issuing their own um, identifier numbers, much like social security numbers, right? Yeah. I would want the government to, to issue that versus a private company because, right, this is yeah. government funding. So anyway, so yay for them for doing that. Yay for thinking it through. But guess what? There's a process. And so um, uh, the example I was referring to uh, for a recent federal grant, they um, it was it was um, it was an NEA grant. But what struck me as I was going through, I was going to pull it. Well, it's underneath a the file there, but it, it was a it was a good 50 page read there. But they talked about the importance of having the UEI um, unique entity identifier number assigned. 
but wait, they're like, well, you need to make sure you're registered in login.gov, sam.gov, sam.gov, and grants.gov, and in that order, and if you're not, you need to stop what you're doing and hop on and get it registered because, and wait for it, they're, they do all tie together, but you then needed to go into grants.gov and submit a short form mm -hmm. that must be approved before you could go into the NEA portal and submit the grant that was actually a shorter form proposal form um, under certain government rules and regs. But that, that, that's like five different steps and yep. the portal would open for the grants.gov portal would open for that registration form simple but you had to do it and had to do it in a certain way and couldn't cut and paste and um i think you had to meet at the crossroads um at midnight i don't even know it was there was a lot of stuff yeah. going on and then you had five days to submit the grant through the portal. So there was lots of coordination that needed to occur. And um, that, that is not alone, um, just grants for DOJ grants, Department of Justice, ERA Commons, and there's probably more that are not coming to top of mind now. But just make sure that not only are those, that you have those, but that the passwords are current and you need to decide who's going to be the workplace manager and who's going to be the AOR, the authorized something, something, um, the authorized operation, organizational representative, representative. I, I, we're going for that. And if we're wrong, just email us at hello at heyday services and go <laughs> y'all knuckleheads. It's actually this. And we'll be like, thanks. But um, you see why I hate acronyms. My point being, there's a lot of admin stuff that has to go down before you can get to where you need to be. To, to, so you're reading the instructions and you wanna back up and make sure, and it's really a good idea to just do that at least once a year anyway. Make sure you're in login.gov, sam.gov, grants.gov, and just make sure you're abreast of all that because you don't wanna be finagling that while you're trying to actually put the proposal together. No, because if you've never done all that, let me tell you, I just helped a client with it. It took us over a month to yeah. get their UEI and SAM.gov registration, not because the client was lazy, but like we submitted everything. It took weeks before SAM.gov got back to us and was like, there's an issue here. You need to fix this. And so then we had to reload things. And then we, finally what we ended up doing was calling there. They've got a 1-800 number. We called and I told her, I was like, do not hang up the phone until the issue is resolved. You know, and the guy kept trying to put her off. He was like, well, there's companies you can pay that'll help you. Yes, there are. You should but not why have to pay a company to should, register for federal grant funding. No, it is she a free process. Breaking in and screeching. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no, I was mad. She's texting me. I'm going. Nope. Do not do that. Stay on the phone with him. If he can't help you, ask for his manager. Um, and you hate to be rude, but at the same time, it's like you speak with your manager because some of y'all. Yeah, be able to help I, me. I know. I know. Two middle-aged white ladies telling you to ask for the manager is not <laughs> our best look. But. but but do, in, yeah, this, in this particular case, yes. also government employee telling a nonprofit that you need to spend money to apply for federal funding. Welcome to no. know. Yeah, no, 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 no. There's yeah, that's his job. And they should be able to help you. And if they can't, they should pass you on to a colleague who can. There so, you go. Yeah. And it, so just to say that even if you're on top of it, it, could, it can take a long I've time. I've heard horror stories of it taking six months. So if you're like, oh, I got a grant due in 30 days and you don't have any of these registrations, start there today, now, immediately, and just know that you may not make this deadline. But if you're like- And being oh. able to explain that. And yes. I found and cited in an email chain, I'm like, is this, you need this, 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 and this. And if you don't have it, they actually said in this particular um, RFP, this can take- several weeks please do not wait until the last minute so sometimes these um rfps no foes or foas can be your friends and you can do my time-honored advice of blame the funder if someone's like yeah. well i don't understand why we have to blah, 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 and it's like because they said so because the people with yep. the money said so i'm not saying that's a great way to live your life your whole life but that will really help in these situations diffuse the well the grant i just don't want to write grants it's like the grant writer quote is telling you that if y'all aren't registered it doesn't matter my feelings are immaterial 
you, yeah. you know, it's a, it's one of those, you got to be this tall to ride this ride moments. This is what yeah. is required. If we can't do it, we can't apply. True story. Uh, and also it. AR, I looked it up. It is authorized organization representative. So look at us knowing things. Way too <laughs> for that acronym. In the recesses <laughs> of my mind. <laughs> so, um, so Amanda, what else? Um, we pay so attention to? Attachments. There oh. are always, always attachments when it comes to federal grants. Um, and they can range. Well, for, most grant, for most grants, only yeah. for federal. Federal and state generally have more attachments. I feel like they do. So I feel like they, do too. they may want to see resumes of key employees. They may want organizational charts, maps showing where, you know, if you're doing infrastructure type projects, they want to know where this project's happening. Mm -hmm. They may want a resolution passed by your board of directors, um, letters of support. They may want to see planning documents in support of the project you're talking about. Survey results, pictures. I mean, I, I'm working on the one I showed y'all the RFP at the beginning. They want the current year's budget. They want last year's budget. Mm -hmm. They want your most recent audit. They There's a financial form you have to fill out to show that you have your act together and actually could handle managing federal grants. So um, oftentimes in federal grants too, there's a um, lobbying form you have to fill out. Yep. Don't let that freak you out. Like lobbying is okay. You just can't use federal funds to lobby, but otherwise it's not, it's not like oh, we paid a lobbyist. This is bad. No, nope, they just want to know who it is to make sure you're not using federal funds to pay them. Right. So just figure out, that's one of the first things I look at because I'm trying to figure out, do I already have all of these things? If not, how quickly can I find it? Or is it something I'm going to have to create new? Like if I need a map, so, you know, you're, you have to figure out, well, Who's going to do that for you? Is it you? Do you have the ability to do it? Do you have, you know, maybe you have a GIS department or maybe someone in engineering, depending on where you work, who knows? So I'm always trying to figure out who has the things I need, who can create the things I need, because I want to get to them early oh, to yeah. give them time to fit what I need for them within their very busy schedule, right? So uh, make sure if you need support letters and other things, you get and on you that. You may need letters of commitment versus letters of support, yes. right? Letters of commitment are, I do this, you do that, you do that, I do this, love the management. And they're a little yeah. more complicated than that, but that's the gist. Or um, official memorandums of agreement or memorandums of understanding. Because if you are partnering, that's how you can show evidence of said partnership. So that's another that's attachment right. you may have to think yeah. about. Um, another thing is, you know, sometimes they're very persnickety about the the type of file, especially with grants.gov. You know, they may only take a PDF or a Word document or Excel. So you've got, if you're excluding pictures, you can't just upload a JPEG maybe. You may have to put that into some other type of a document. Um, another thing is sometimes file size. It has to be under a certain, like it may be, you know, one megabyte or smaller. And if your file's too big, that's something I was like, I don't know how to shrink file sizes. So I had to go find someone who could show me how to do that. Right. So, and these are the things that are going to, as you're uploading them at the last hour, right. Cause it's time to submit and you're uploading them and then they, they're getting rejected because it's the wrong file size or type. Those are the kind of things that are going to give you a heart attack. So, um, and I will tell you too, if you're working remotely, um, I had an issue before where um, I had a great client who had every single document I needed and then some. We were doing this huge trail project and they had a lot of drawings of the trail, like mm -hmm. loop, things like that. And it wasn't even, the hard part was from them, they couldn't just email it to me, right? Because the file size was so big, but they weren't allowed to use Dropbox or Google, right? So we, but they did use SharePoint. So that was our workaround is they gave me access to their SharePoint just long enough for me to download the documents I needed so then I could work my magic and get them uploaded, right? So just know that attachments may seem like, oh, that's just a few documents, maybe, but it could also be the thing that causes you the most pain. So pay attention to that. And those are things that you can work on in advance. I think a lot of people yes. want to just get to writing. I want to get to writing. It's like, before you get to writing, sir, mm -hmm. madam, person, um, look at some things that are maybe outside your control and yeah. in terms of sign offs and con contracts or whatever, and get those out the door first, yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, something else that's good to get out of the way um, 
that I did when I first started writing grants, I was like, budget? No, I am a writer. No, no, I'm a grant pro with this stuff. And it's, if you understand the, if you get the budget and you get everyone on your grants team, um, your finance and your program people and your ED, whoever it is. And I recommend that it's not just you trying to figure yeah. things out. Um, if you get them to stack hands on it, a, an easier way to do that is with the budget than writing out this whole program description and having everyone edit it. I mean, that's yeah. like getting pecked to death by ducks. It's just, but people are like, well, should you use this word? I'm like, should you review the program and make sure that we're saying what it's, we'll, we'll fix it later. But so taking it to a budget, mm -hmm. um, budget plus maybe some goals and objectives work will really just like getting those attachments out there, get that out there. And that's all part of the instructions that will come in your RFP, NOFO or, and all these other things that we had talked about, but it's just really just your instruction guide for the yeah. grant, for your federal grant. Um, some of the quick sort of quick and dirty to walk you through this comes in the budget discussions. And also often it can come in the first, um, one to five pages where they're yeah. giving the overview. Um, you know, you're already going there to go, are we really competitive, even though we might be eligible? How many grants, this and that? What's the size? Are there technical training? All that is usually within the first handful of pages, including things like minimum and maximum grant award amounts. Mm -hmm. You want to get that out of the way. If you're if you are only looking for the, well, this is my this is my opinion based on my experience. If you're only looking for thirty grand to complete a project, and the minimum to for this particular federal award is a hundred thousand, just let's move on. And also, y'all, there are easier ways to raise thirty grand than a giant <laughs> federal, federal grant. grant. Yeah. And I would say that for many clients, for myself, if you were to give me, uh, if you were to transfer 30 grand into my account today, it would be transformational for me. But so I'm not poo-pooing the amount. It's the amount plus the grant management work. But more importantly, yeah. for the context of our discussion today, minimum and maximum. Conversely, if the maximum is $100,000 and your project is $10 million, might want to think about that. Does that meet your need for the and, yeah. um, for the for the program that you're funding? And also, um, most federal grants, and this is probably going to be later on in their instructional document, which they could call a NOFA or an OFA or an RFP. What will they not fund, and how can you find the the funding for that? I'll just a yeah. quick example. Um, food, food and liquor drinks usually not things that are funded through federal funding. Why? Because someone a long time ago, or maybe not so long ago, probably took advantage of this and gave a catering contract to their mother's cousin's mm -hmm. dog groomer married to their uncle. I don't even know. And that's why we can't have nice things. But um, if you're, if you, if you are um, in a, some sort of uh, family literacy or, workforce development program and you want to offer people lunch, or if you're having a special historical exhibit and you want to have champagne at the reception, pop your corks, but just not with federal dollars. And you will know that by reading the budget section of your RFP. Something else that may pop up match is a match. Um, match meaning you need to put in funds to match in some certain way the amount that you're asking for in the for the grant. Sometimes match can be all cash. Sometimes it's one to one for every dollar you request, you've got to put a dollar on the um, proverbial table. Sometimes it's not. And that is why you're the subject matter expert on this grant, because you're going to know and understand and be able to explain that to people because this can get everyone into a lot of trouble. Sometimes you don't have to have match dollars all in place. I say that because I used to say you always have to have it. And by golly, two weeks ago, I was reading a grant. <laughs> I'm like, dang, they said that all the match is not required. It was a multi-year grant. You didn't have to have your match all documented at the time you were submitting the grant. I will continue to say that's super rare, but it does exist. Um, 
And all, speaking of match and having things in hand, it's also really important to understand, not only for the budget, but for just for the program or the project itself, looking at the grant period. Many federal program grants are off or are, are, can be multi-year, which mm -hmm. is fantastic, but they may not start. Um, this particular grant that I'm thinking about, the deadline is July, uh, mid-July 2023, which is, um, well, we're, no, we're not in July yet, but we're almost in July. But the work doesn't start until June 2024. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that and then it would go for two years after that so you're talking about june 2024 to, to june 2026 mm -hmm. right if this is a two-year yeah. grant yeah. so you know then it's what will our budget look like how can we estimate how can we provide those projections all of those things can come up when you're looking um through your rfp nofo or ofa and reading them and knowing that you need to look for specific things like that because you will be the explainer, right? You will help mm -hmm. folks decide, oh yeah, we've got this, or huh, in this particular case, the client was like, right, year two of that program, we're having extensive facility work, so the program may not even be going in that iteration, so, yeah. huh. I mean, it was definitely food for thought. So anyway, those are important things to pay attention to when you're reading, like things to look for um, in the first five pages. And then there's always a table of contents and you can just click on it and go right to it to go to the budget section where some of these details should be laid out. And that's also the time if it's not clear, that's a great time in the review process to make a list of all the questions that are not just budget related and either go to that technical assistance webinar or email or call your program contact and just know that your results may vary your mileage may vary with how responsive and how quickly people get back to you true story so um, another nice thing about, um, especially federal RFPs, they typically let you know what you're going to be getting yourself into in terms of reporting requirements. Um, and so it's nice to understand that from the outset, right? So the particular grant I showed you, I was working on right now, the grant you can ask our minimum and max is 30,000 to $200,000, right? And once we read all of the reporting requirements, I told my client, I'm like, you have to determine your pain point. But if I were you, $30,000 is not enough money for all that they're going to require out of you. And I said, I can't tell you what that magic number is. But you know, to me, in my experience, 30,000 is not enough. So let's talk about this. Um, but typically your RFP is going to let you know exactly what all they're going to ask of you on the back end. So they're, usually they're going to let you know, you know, how often are you doing narrative reports, basically where you're kind of letting them know, Hey, yep. this is what we've done. This is the issues. This is what we're doing moving forward. They could be monthly. They could be quarterly. They could be every six months. Right. So you want to know that. Um, they often want financial reports to know how much money you're spending. And you're also typically having to document every penny. So they're going to want invoices and receipts and that sort of thing. Um, they're going to let you know as part of this too, like how are they paying you? Cause there's going to be work on your end. You know, are, is it a reimbursement process? Are they paying you all up front? Is it a payment plan? But you're still going to have to set up some stuff mm -hmm. with the agency. Um, are they going to do site visits? You know, and if so, how many? Because um, that's going to take time and effort on your part. Um, are there any other reporting requirements, right? If um, when it comes to federal grants, if you get money directly from the feds and then you decide to subaward anything, you have to report in the FAFADA system, which is the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Go with your acronyms. Yes. And it's the... Uh, I think the website is fsrs.gov is, is the, um, yeah, because it's the FAFADA subrecipient reporting system. So fsrs.gov is the website where you go and do that. So that may be an additional layer. So 
just again, read all of it. And if you do get the grant, they spell all, everything out in detail again in your grant awards. So don't feel like you have to have all that memorized and know this, but it still is a good idea to understand how much work on the back end. Because again, if it's a small amount, you may decide mm, the amount of time I'm going to spend doing all this reporting is not worth the thirty thousand dollars they're giving me. Yeah, right? if you go spend fifteen thousand dollars a year managing a thirty thousand dollar grant, you may want to think mm -hmm. about that. Or it may be the right thing for you to do, but give it thought. Yeah. Well, we um the first time I experienced money not being worth what it was, we had applied for a, a trail grant. We had applied for a million dollars. They came back and I think they gave us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars instead. So instead of building <laughs> A little trail. Yeah, we built a fourth <laughs> of what we were going to build. So they allowed us to narrow our scope, right? So that was fine. But of course, to us, we're like $250,000. That's a lot of money. But the reality when it comes to federal construction projects with all the other things, we had to follow the Davis-Bacon Act. Yep. We had to, there was just, there was environmental things we had to do that was extra that cost more money. It's just, it costs more money and it took longer and it was a lot of my time and a lot of some other people's time managing it that that was the point where we decided if it was a federal construction project, we wanted at least half a million dollars to make it worth our while. Now that was back in 2003. So I don't know, you know, and again, that's not a magic answer. I know some people that won't take federal construction projects unless it's a million dollars. Some won't touch it unless it's two. So it's, there's not a one size fits all. It's, it's all about pain point and time and cost, but um, you do need to think about that. Or if you were a historic um, site, you know, yeah. a $50,000 $50, federal grant may put the roof on that will allow you to keep going. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's not, we, we're never suggesting, oh, it must be this number. We're saying, think no. about it and in the context of the kind of work that you're doing and yeah. what makes sense. And are there other ways to pay for it? Because because you're right, there may be that may be your only funding source for that particular project. Well, then heck yeah, we'd do it for that amount because it wouldn't happen otherwise. So it's just there's a lot to think about. A lot to, and there are a couple of other just I know we could this this I mean there are people who give entire multi day workshops about this and we're just on each on the I mentioned Davis Bacon. I went to a forty hour training just on yeah. Davis Bacon. And by no means am I an expert, but I know enough to be dangerous after that training, right? And doing it. But yeah, you could easily dive into any of these topics forever. So do you want to hop over to um just a, a quick overview of the different kinds of sections? Sure. We can do that. Federal, just in the interest of because I you know there and there are other things that might come up in addition to Davis Bacon, particularly on construction projects or other things, by American preference for veterans. If you're working with the by uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, then there's that Justice 40 lens where you really need to make sure you can document that 40 there's a 40% is is benefiting communities that were traditionally marginalized or underserved. Mm -hmm. as classified by the the federal agency um so all of those things you'll find the details in the ofa or the details in the or the noaa you know what i mean nofo um you'll find details in there and also in the in the technical um assistance webinars which again not exciting viewing but yes maybe if it helps you yeah. get a transformative grant then maybe that's where you find your excitement so true story yep. things to consider um, yep and then so your R your rfp does usually lay out like okay so now that we've told you what you can do and how much and all that kind of stuff then they usually towards the end start getting into this is what your grant application must consist of right yep um and with the federal grant usually the first thing is the sf 424 which that stands for standard form it is a pdf document that they will give you that you fill out it's mostly contact information what grant are you applying for it's pretty standard stuff um oftentimes they ask for an abstract that's an executive summary. Usually it's a hundred words, 300 words. Um, you're just kind of quickly summarizing your overall process. Um, then they usually ask you to submit your program narrative, which could consist of different sections. Generally you're talking about your problem statement or your needs assessment. 
um, your methodology, you know, what's, what's your program? What are you doing? How are you implementing things? Your goals and objectives, they may ask about sustainability. They may ask how you're going to evaluate your program. So kind of the standard sections of a grant usually get lumped into that program narrative. And they're very specific about you have five pages or you have 10 pages to answer these things, right? Um, then there's going to be a budget and almost always with the federal grant, they're going to ask for a budget narrative that goes with that. Um, and they may ask if you are claiming an indirect cost rate, um, they may ask for that documentation with, which if you're sitting here going, what's an indirect cost rate? We'll just go back a few episodes where we interviewed, um, Karen Norris and we talked mm-hmm. all about that. Um, then they may have some forms to fill out. Like there's a financial management form, a system of internal controls, Um, They may ask about your disclosure of lobbying. Um, And also on federal grants, they often ask you to disclose if you are high risk or not. Okay. Um, And if you are, you have to explain what agency listed you as high risk. When did it happen? What were the circumstances? And if you've never heard that phrase before, all that means is if you got some grant funding and you weren't, you as in your agency, didn't do the best job in managing it, you didn't do anything illegal. You didn't do anything horrendously long, wrong. Nobody stole anything, but they're like, y'all aren't real good at grant management. You need some handholding. They will label your agency high risk. Okay. You will know if this happened to you because they will document the heck out of it. You will know, you will have letters upon letters. Um, but all that means is you're letting that funder know, Hey, we're still eligible for federal grants, but we might be a nightmare to deal with. So that funder if it's real competitive, this is your sign about eligible versus competitive. You could hit every mark, but if you're high risk, and it's a real competitive grant application, chances are you're not going to be the one to get it because they know it's going to take extra work on their part to work you through it. Now, I will say too, if you are high risk, it's not a forever category. You that's can true. you can put some systems in place. You can go back to being low risk, right? So, but that's just a quick, if you've never heard that phrase before, that's what that's about. So if they ask and you're not high risk, that's real easy. That's not applicable. Some other ways you can use these instruction guides for grants to help you. And here's the thing. We're more than 35 minutes into the podcast, and we haven't said a word about the actual writing. That's because 80% of this is not writing. And I just, I think this episode and many others is just proof. But one thing that can aid you in your writing, how long, how in depth, of course, you want to go through and answer each question as clearly, succinctly, and thoroughly as you can. But yeah. looking at the the scoring information, which is I've never seen, I've never seen a federal grant that that lacked this. I'm sure someone's gonna be like, well, a one time long ago, good for you. I'm just saying most of the folks who write put these together are gonna tell you how to score it, which is a transparency not always available in private funding. So if you, and it's usually points or it mm-hmm. could be percentages. Take a gander at that and know that in the, when you're drafting different sections of the, of the program narrative that Amanda mentioned, the problem statement, methodology, program description, goals, objectives, evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. The ones that have the most points assigned to them are generally the ones that I will, will be the longest for me. Yeah. This just kind of Medium. makes sense, right? So you mm-hmm. can use that. If you're new to this, use that as a guide. And if you have a 20-page limit, 25, 50, 12, this will help guide you. Um, so in crafting the narrative and thinking how much space you have, if they're not word limits or even character limits, as I have seen on some of these shorter federal um, applications, then understand that um, you'll just can use the points assigned as how the grant reviewers are going to look at that. So generally, not always, but most of the time, it's going to be your program description and your statement of need are going to be the heftier sections Mm -hmm. and the other sections will be shorter unless they pull out big chunks of the program section and put them in different sections. Yeah. And the way you're going to know that is that you're going to read your RFP. Um, a couple of other things that you might find that could be useful for you um, and a note. Sometimes there are attachments that you have to, to, to send in that have no points assigned to them, but you have to do it. So again, just read and understand your list of attachments versus how the narrative and other elements are going to be scored. So just know that these can be two different things. 
oftentimes in larger state and federal applications, they will helpfully include a little checklist to kind of help you make keep up with the attachments and the elements. So that's another thing you could pull out, you know, make it a PDF, put it either to the side or print it out even if that's what works for you to help you sort of make sure you're getting everything in there. Because you could have the best written program description and the best research needs and assets statement, but if you don't have some little old form that, that they are asking for uploaded, it won't let you submit the grant these days. Um, or you may get disqualified in the review process if you are able to submit the grant. So just keeping that in mind. But speaking of this, the grant submission process, Amanda's going to be talking about that because that's also something that they're going to be talking about in your RFP um, and your NOFO and your OFA. Yep. They usually give pretty detailed instructions on where you go to submit, whether it's grants.gov or another website or a combination thereof. Um, so pay attention to those instructions about where and how and why. Um, more often than not, they will tell you, please submit 72 hours ahead of the deadline. They're not playing. They're not because that's, Don't play. You'll, as you go, you'll realize you'll go to hit submit and you'll get an error message because there's a file that's too big or a file that's not the right tagging or Kimberly has a fun story. I don't know if I would call it fun. Uh, <laughs> I, I would, and I was, I was not, um, but a colleague of mine was, was um, helping their client through, and this was an HHS grant um, that I had assisted on, but I was not doing the heavy lifting of the, of the uh, portal process, but they got everything and we were hammering it. It's like, got to get done. We've got to get this done. This has got to be uploaded. We do not want to wait um, because I've heard of people getting shut out of the process. Like you do all that work and you can't submit it. You waited till the last day. Mm -hmm. Here's the kickback that was so strange to me. Cause we were just like, Oh, okay. Everything we've checked off everything where, you know, if you have perfectionist tendencies, it can work for you and against you in this, in this instance. Yes. Um, yes. So, but we were like, okay, okay all the attachments are in, everything's in, everything's up at or under where it needs to be, everything's been approved, everything's uploaded. We go through grants.gov, then we go through ERA Commons, which is another portal. I really thought grants.gov was supposed to be a one-stop shop. That ain't how it's playing out, big surprise. So now we know, and let's move forward. But there was an error message on ERA Commons, and this was two days before the grant was due. It was a PDF of their 501c3 certificate from back when DIRT was new, right? And it was like, out of everything, and I mean, we're talking letters of commitment, we're talking multiple, multiple attachments. There was something about that PDF attachment of this ancient 501c3 letter that the system kicked out. So they just had to like rescan it finally and save it and upload it. And then it took it. I'm not saying, I mean, that that's like, Oh, that's cute. It's not cute when you've been working on it for five hours and you're tired and you can't understand and no one's answering the phone at the agency and you don't know what's happening. So just know it can be something weird like that. Having that more than 72 hours before the deadline can yeah. give you time to troubleshoot that and go to the copy machine and scan that ancient document once again and mm -hmm. get it uploaded. So you never know. You just yep. never know. True story. Well, and I found too, like the only time I've worked places where power goes out or the internet goes out, it's always deadline day. And so if you've got those extra days, that gives you time to go to another location, right? And get it taken care of. But if you're like in the final hour, you might not have time to drive to the library you and get set up and get nice logged time. in. And whew. So, yep. Um, I guess to, to sum up a, a heap and helping of information <laughs> is um, there, there's just, there just are a lot of moving parts to a federal grant application. Federal funding can be transformative. I mean, just improving lives, improving the environment, improving response times, improving after school programs, uh, taking away uh, uh, barriers to accessing um hospital care or mental health services, but you need to really be cognizant that what can keep you from achieving that goal is not 
necessarily did I use the wrong word to describe something. It's did I understand that I have all the registrations in place? Are we truly competitive? Do I have all the attachments? Does the budget make sense? Does I match the narrative? Um, am I saving everything in the right kind of file format as specified in the RFP NOFA or or OFA, NOAA, whatever it was, you know what I'm talking about. Just <laughs> yeah, it can, <laughs> e I E I E I O. I just really, it's like, oh, but it really is as soon as you get wind of, yes, we're moving forward, hop into that document and just learn everything and read it multiple times, highlight, condense a version if you need to, pull out that checklist. Those are the things that are going to help you be more successful when you're looking for federal funding. Yep. She knows what she's talking about. So, um, and no, too, most funders, um, by law, they have to give 30 days notice between when they release that RFP and when the deadline is. So that's why when you see 30 days and you're like, that's all, that's all they have to give you by law. But some of them are kind and give you 45 days or 60 days. But that's used the max I've really seen, not saying that there aren't some exceptions, but 60 days is very, very generous. So just know that as soon as it's released, Every day counts. Every day matters. You're going to need every single one of those days to be working on something. So you definitely want to be reading that RFP as close to release date as possible to give you enough time to work on all of these things. So just make sure you read carefully, put together that team that's going to help you assemble everything as quickly as possible and just get rolling. Also, if this is something that comes out more than once a year yep. or comes out every year and maybe this year is yes. just not your year. Get started now for next year. And the pro the chances are if it's something that comes around twice a year even and is not something brand new and time bound like the bipartisan BIL, like the bipartisan infrastructure law, chances are you'll be able to come around again. And this will just put you in a better position to be more competitive, score higher points and get that money. So happy reading. Well, we are so glad. You chose to listen to the Fundraising Heyday podcast. Look, even if it, if it's your first time, welcome. Hi, hello. Um, if you've been with us since the beginning, welcome back. You are why we keep doing what we're doing. Please uh, consider leaving us a review, um, especially if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts. It's real easy. You can go to our homepage on Apple Podcasts, scroll down, um, and there's a place to leave a review. I think it's by stars. If you write a couple of sentences, you could do it in um, less than five minutes. And it would help us connect to other people and just spread the word and just build the community. So we would appreciate it. Um, if you just can't get enough of that heyday stuff, trot on over to heydayservices.com, which is our um, website where you can sign up for the heyday hot takes, where we have that no-go, go, no-go no guide that, you, that you, we talked about earlier. It's H-A-Y-D-A-Y services.com. Um, and you can find out just what's going on and um, catch up with other episodes of the podcast if you want to go back in time. So yeah, check us out. Thank you again to our season six sponsor, D.H. Leonard Consulting and Grant Writing Services. We appreciate their support in making grants less stressful. Visit their website, dhleonardconsulting.com, to download their latest resources today. Yep. We are so, so honored that you chose to spend time with us today. Um, please join us next time. We are going to be talking about um, grants in the Human Services Network. We've got a nonprofit we're going to highlight that is doing some amazing work. So we're excited to share that with you all. We'll talk to you then. See ya. See ya.